Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third day of the eighth edition of the morning. Firstly, I'd like to extend my gratitude to everyone here at the summit. As we all know, the theme of this year's webinar is India at policy, the recognition of the inevitable challenges and questions that will arise as India accelerates in the future. To continue with our summit, I'd like to introduce to our topic of discussion today, rising number of clean startups. I'd like to start by quoting some statistics. According to one survey, there are 1,000 unicorns in the world, but according to another, the failure rate is 60 percent. There are 32 megacons in the world, but 75% venture back startups fail. In 2021, 5.4 million startup applications were filed, but most of them lack market demand. So where do we stand right now? How long can we start up this model last? Is it necessary to change the validation methodology? And how viable are startups eventually? Our honorable speakers for today will answer these questions and provide us with several insights. I'd like Ayush and Shreya to introduce them to the audience without further ado. I hope that everyone enjoys the conversation today and gains something useful from this summit. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. With immense pleasure, I welcome our speaker, Mr. Deepan Sahu, who is the Assistant Innovation Director at the Innovation Cell of Ministry of Education, housed at All India Council for Technical Education. Mr. Sahu is a policy entrepreneur and practitioner who is actively contributing to the growth of the Indian startup ecosystem. Currently, he is leading the formulation and nationwide implementation of various national policy initiatives directed towards institutionalizing institu innovation practices at higher education institutions, such as the National Innovation and Startup Policy and Institutions Innovation Council, to name a few. He works towards strengthening innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem development at educational institutions. We thank you, sir, for joining us in today's event. We, with your expertise in the domain, we look forward to hearing your views on the topic of discussion. Next, we are delighted to welcome Ms. Raki Aswal for the panel discussion. She is the CFO as well as the Global Head of Accounting and Product Owner at Saxo Group India. She is currently in charge of managing Saxo Bank India Division and Direct Finances, Accounting, Taxation and Compliance. She is a qualified CA and CPA. She completed her post-graduation in management for professionals from UCLA Anderson School of Management. Ms. Raki has extensive ex experience in finance and has overseen countrywide finance operations at several prestigious companies. She has been a part of statutory committees for the organizations she has worked for, including CSR, Porsche, and Gratuity Trust. We would like to express our gratitude to ma'am for participating in today's event and look forward to hear her thoughts on the topic of discussion. Good evening, everyone. It is a privilege to have with us Mr. Amit Singhal, one of the renowned investors in our country at, here at the summit. Sir is the CEO of Startup Buddies Services Private Limited, Director of ESR Business Advisors Private Limited, and a founding partner of Fluid Ventures. He is a qualified chartered accountant with 15 plus years of work experience across various industries. Sir has extensive experience in part administration, accounting, Investor reporting, strategic planning and budgeting, forecasting, treasury, processes and controls. He is highly active as a seed stage investor in the Indian startup ecosystem. Till now, Sir has invested in a good number of startups like InnoShare, Inpio, Orwell, eSafe, among others. He is also the national chairperson of Startup Innovation Council, Confederation of Indian MSMEs. So, we thank you for being a part of our event and our students are looking forward to hear from you about entrepreneurship and career development. We are also delighted to welcome Mr. Jitin Masi, founder and CEO of Save In, 
as a part of the e summit at Vivan 8.0, the flagship annual business summit of Aki Kolkata. Mr. Rossin has more than 10 years of experience holding leadership positions across banking, insurance, and consulting sectors. Uh, an alum of RT Kolkata, Jitin began his career with Aviva Life Insurance, where he was responsible for strategic analysis and planning, competition benchmarking, and financial analysis. Post that, he had a productive instinct at PNY uh, and then Anderson Bank, where he won ET's Young Leadership Award uh, in 2014 and then bankbazaar.com. Post that, he built Rupidity, a digital lending platform that offered new edge lending solutions to Indian customers. He is currently the founder and CEO of Savin, India's first buy now pay later uh, platform focused on healthcare products and services, aimed at facilitating timely and quality care for Indians through flexible and affordable payment plans. We welcome you back to your alma mater, sir, and our students are eager to hear and take some key insights from you. moderate this discussion panel. Sir has been with IFP for over 20 years. He is currently the head of graduate studies management. He is a PhD in finance from Rabindran Bharti University. Throughout his career, he has published around 13 papers on mutual funds management, foreign exchange reserve management and other topics in reputed international journals. He has authored a book on international financial management and edited books like U.S. Current Account Deficit Global Implications, Mutual Fund Industry Issues and Experiences, to name a few. So, we thank you for accepting our invitation for moderating this summit. With your vast knowledge in the domain, we look forward to make the most of the summit. I would like Jayendra Kumar C. Sir to take forward the discussion. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. So, topic is very good. Rising number of paid startups is venture capital and valuation the driver of unsustainable business model. We have uh, industry leaders in this area. So we have policy makers, we have bankers, we have investors, as well as we have startups also. So we have a uh, very good discussion, definitely. So we start with we start with the policy makers. So what are the startup policies? How you can go about it? Everything you will come to know. And after we finish our discussion, we'll take questions and it will be open to the floor for discussion. So I'll start Mr. Mr. Dibun Shahu. Uh, Hello. Is it audible? Yes. Yes. Thank you, uh, Actually, uh, when I received the invitation from ESL, so I first uh, asked what is the purpose? And fortunately, one week back, I have received another invitation from IIT Delhi for similar kind of event. Then I got confused actually because I missed that event to attend. So I thought uh, maybe they have tried again uh, and in inviting me to that one. But later, when I searched my email, I found it is from IIT Kolkata. <laughs> then I said, okay, it's okay because I, uh, during that time I will be in Bhupneshwar, so it will be easy for me to come down. And so I accepted that. But later, when I gone through the thesis content again the, about the whole thing, then the topic itself is very, I found it very unique because it is rising number of failure startups. Actually, this is kind of a tendency 
in our ecosystem, we avoid to use the name of error because always we have trained only to see the success. If you will not get it, then actually uh, it is actually it is, it is kind of taboo, right? We are avoiding the word of failure, but actually it's good thing that institutions like IAT, they are making it failure as a kind of a celebration. And if we will learn from failure from each attempt, I think there is an opportunity to move forward. And that should be the culture, that should be the practice in our education institutions. And the topic is very unique. And from the policy perspective, I will say something. I'm not able to see the side, so please don't mind. And if you want, I will come down there. But uh, you want me to be there? <laughs> so, uh, because the topic is on failure and the startup is why startups are failing, let's understand because you all are from the MBA and I hope you must have gone through the first term on economics, right? So, in economics, you must have learned about market world and analysis economy. So, let me throw one a very quick question. You must have your invisible hand, right? Yes, invisible hand, Adam Smith. Yes. Actually, market has this invisible power and which autocorrect and only the best fit they survive. Remaining, they just get out of market. So that is the principle. But actually, it is proven that companies or as uh, enterprises those adopt innovation, their performance increases 10 times. And also it is already been proven that without entrepreneurship, without innovation culture, no country will move forward. It may be advanced country or a developing country or an underdeveloped country, everywhere innovation entrepreneurship is, is now necessary. It is not a uh, fashion, it is a necessity. So to make it happen, India it's already seen, already set a uh, uh, vision that by 2047, India should be advanced country. By 2025, it should be a 5 trillion dollar economy. Now, already <laughs> India is the top global economy. Just two months back, India moved, moved to the fifth position, left Britain behind the sixth position, right? And by 2030, we want to be the top three. That means after China, USA, next is India. To, to achieve this national goal, again, innovation and entrepreneurship is going to be the key strategy. Without this, this is not going to happen. You know what is the skilling rate of our youth? India is one of the youngest nations, right? 60% of workforce are falling in the age of 25 to 40. That means 60% of you, your workforce are young, that's we are the youngest nation. But the skilling rate is only 4%. That means our youth, only 4% youth have the desired skill and they go for upgradation and reskilling as per the industry requirement. The remaining 96% uh, youth, they only just carry with the uh, knowledge or the skill they earn during their graduate or undergraduate or the postgraduate and they survive or they just try to uh, stay in the market. So they never go for upgradation. But in contrast, Countries like South Korea, Canada, USA, and even Australia, and China, it is above 65%. So, if we want to make India as a knowledge powerhouse, or if you want to achieve all this kind of advanced economy by 2047 or a 5 trillion dollar economy by 2025, then we have to change all this structure. And you know how many institutions we have in our country, and higher education institutions? 63,000. 63,000 higher education institutions. So they are producing 4.2 crores of graduates every year. So they are into the major market. And out of these 63,000, only 10,000 institutions are technical. Remaining 45,000 institutions are non technical. They are arts and science and commerce, all these kind of colleges. So when I say technical, management college must come from technical. All kind of professional and management colleges. So these 10,000 colleges, they produce around 35, the intake capacity is 35 lakhs. That means every year, total 35 lakh students can take admission. But actually, only 25 lakh students get admitted. That means remaining 10 lakh seats remain vacant. And out of this 25 lakhs, by end of the fourth year, only 18 lakh students get graduate remaining. They just they drop out and they leave the course in between. 
and out of 18 lakhs, only 11 lakh students get placed. Remaining are remain on place. This is the status of our Indian education system so far. So recently in 2020, National Education Policy 2020 to 2020 came into existence where we have focused more on quality education rather than quantity education. And quality education, one of the indicators is innovation and another indicator is the entrepreneurship. And if we will convert the attitude, the ability and the aspiration of our youth towards innovation and entrepreneurship, especially during the day, academic time itself, and we provide all kind of support system, environment, and a facility so that they will understand the innovation entrepreneurship jargon concept and they will see the innovation entrepreneurship as an alternative career option, which was not there, there in our system so far. Everybody see innovation entrepreneurship just as an extracurricular activity. So we have to shift from extracurricular activity mindset to in curricular and co curricular activity so that a student can see that okay if he wants to uh, visualize a career plan he can choose a startup as an alternative career option which was not there but now it is happening since the three to four years so this is the actual point of intervention for the government of india even all state governments they've started so many state state start officials uh, i think more than 25 ministries in the central government they have this innovation and startup agenda and recently in three years back Ministry of Education has established an innovation cell through which we have designed so many policy programs. And I will only mention three policy programs which is very, very relevant to you all. The first policy program is called National Innovation and Startup Policy. So this NISP, this is designed only for the higher education institutions, which says that starting a startup during the study period is now legitimate activity for a student. And also it empowers faculty to start a startup while acting as a teacher or while teaching. That means now engaging and doing startup is now legitimate, and both student and faculty can start the startup. Only condition is that teaching quality should not be compromised. Then the startup should be based on some of the core competency of the department or the kind of for the research or kind of. Uh, you know, they, they, they skill set what they have. That means if a faculty is doing something, he cannot start a business of Kirana shop. Right? He cannot do something which is just irrelevant to the, his core discipline. If it is following his core discipline, if he wants to take it forward, then he can take start out. Similarly, other domains like IP selling, intellectual property selling, it also tell clearly about what's the equity selling mechanism, what kind of incubation system should be there, and how the facilities will be easily accessible by the students. So all these things are there, and if you spend at least one hour, you will know so many things. Then you will come with a demand to your institutes that this kind of policy, because this policy says that every institute should have their own innovation and entrepreneurship policy by taking the reference of this NISP and also Startup India and uh, Startup India Action Plan and respective state startup mission. So by taking all this, they have to come up with a very contextualized and customized innovation and entrepreneurship policy for their institute. Another program is called Institutions Innovation Council. So we started with a survey in 2017. When we did a survey, we sent the question to all 10,000 all technical institutions. Only 900 institutions took part in that survey. I'm telling you, only 900 across the, across the country. And out of this 900, we only found 400 institutions had some data to provide what kind of innovation and entrepreneurship activities they were doing. This was the situation in our country four years, five years back. No, except IITs, except few IITs, not all IITs, except few IITs, NITs, and some different universities. <laughs> Nobody is bothering about innovation. Even if you go and ask them what is IP, they will tell it is an internet protocol. They will never tell this intellectual property. This was kind of awareness and understanding on innovation and entrepreneurship. But we identified three four intervention points because only uh, out of 63,000 institutes in we have in our country, only 400 institutions have this innovation entrepreneurship awareness. How you can imagine that India will reach to this level of development or this level of growth? That's why we have to bring at least 30% of institutes to into the system, and every institute should be enabled, empowered, and also create an environment so that students will enter in the facility itself. They will start learning about innovation entrepreneurship, 
innovation and entrepreneurship should be taught as a in curricular or co curricular not as extra curricular then there should be a reward system should be an incentive system for the efforts carried out by student or student uh, or or faculty for the innovation or startup venture so that they it will be counted in their performance they will get reward in terms of uh, like gold medal you are getting because of a high gpa similarly also student will get uh, gold medal for the startup achievement during the academic faculty will get promotion if they will support innovation and entrepreneurship if they will start the startup so in this kind of we provision and now many institutions i think more than 2500 institutions including all iits and nits they have already adopted this policy so this is the second program and this institutional innovation council makes sure that innovation and entrepreneurship activities should be happened throughout the year it should not be treated like a placement in placement sir what they generally they do before placement they ask for inter training kind of thing they invite agencies and they give well, like one week training then they ask the students go and appear the placement but for innovation and entrepreneurship throughout the year continuously you, you have to provide the exposure opportunity so that student will avoid to participate in the fast to be activities but later they will start developing their understanding then slowly slowly the interest will come they will understand the jargons terminologies then they will start doing something innovation ideation then gradually in their 20th or 30th attempt they will they will start a startup so as per our iic policy now institutions on an average they organize minimum 30 to 35 activities per year so you just imagine 2017 hardly one or two activities they were conducting but now because of this iic structuring system every institution is organizing minimum 30 to 35 activities per year that means the average exposure of participation by each student has increased 10 times and increasing 10 times means indirectly or directly it is influencing awareness level directly or indirectly it is providing opportunity to participate in more and more programs and because of this policy because of this program because of this kind of institutional structure now more than 6500 institutions so we moved from 400 to 6500 institutions but if you will see this side it is looking very good but we have another side 63000 that means there is long way to go and another intervention we brought that is called auto ranking of institutions on innovation achievement this is again another path breaking policy initiative where we have converted the subjective nature of the ecosystem to objective nature high was back if somebody will ask what is ecosystem you will get something but there is nothing to quantify what is what it is but now because of this innovation ranking framework a startup ecosystem especially in education system can be can be uh, classified into seven components and each component can be measured by using certain data structure or data component and it can be it can it can give a mirror that actually where you stand and how better you are from other institutions of similar kind also you can compare with previous year where you stand and where you are doing now so that helps the institute to mobilize the resources engage the experts and also improve the level so that they will they will move or uh, they will move forward in the ecosystem development so these are the few programs but if we were trying to bring more players more stakeholders to convergence because actually see uh, if again we will create some scheme where already some schemes are available then actually it will not create much impact but bringing so many stakeholders ministries even the governments and non government agencies and especially stakeholders startups founders investors and redirecting them redirecting them towards uh, institutions will be lots of avenues for the students and if they will attempt, if they will fail in one at one attempt then another options will be there to attempt and they will not drop their ideas in between ultimate objective is to trigger the creative tendency of the students to provide them learning opportunities to help them to understand the innovation and entrepreneurship value chain and finally engage them in innovation and, and entrepreneurship activities and building their entrepreneurial ability so that they will perform better in their job or if somebody wants to start a startup they will also perform better in this startup so ultimately making indian education system more innovative entrepreneurial and the stakeholders like faculty and student Have to behave like an innovator and entrepreneur, and if we will achieve at least thirty thousand institutions, 
then I think the day is not so far. We will move from Global Innovation Index, 40th position in 2022, to top 25 position. So, you will surprise to know, in 2016, it, India was positioned in 81st position in Global Innovation Index. Now, in just five years, we have, we have moved off from 81st to 40th, and our target in the next five years, India should move to top 25. So, in this direction, we will bring lots of changes and we will see that there are more job creators, there are more job seekers. I believe you all have this kind of enthusiasm and passion and if you pursue it, I think IIT is going to provide you the best platform. So make use of it because you have nothing to lose, only whatever the things you will do, it only will gain. That is the only principle of philosophy. If you follow them, definitely you will you will find an alternative career option where you will see yourself as an entrepreneur or as an innovator or a patent holder. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Shaw. Uh, I believe we have an only e say. So start another one, innovation say. Okay. So as he pointed out, that most important is innovation as well as entrepreneurship. So we have only entrepreneurship. And I know there are many startups. So many of you are already involved in it. So uh, you can take help from him, advice from him. So, Government of India is doing a lot for this, and uh, you also uh, start this innovation set. So, we carry it forward. So, our next speaker is uh, Ms. Rakhi Oswal. So, let us hear from our side. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm really excited to be here uh, <coughs> coming to college like this and interacting with the students always feels like coming back home. Uh, so thank you for having me here. Uh, my profile is uh, probably a little different uh, from, from others here. Uh, I'm not a founder um, or I'm not running any startup. Uh, but what uh, I've been doing for last 10 years is I've been managing finance uh, of uh, maybe startups or founder run companies. I'm right now working with a European company. It's a 30 year old company, but it is still run by the founder. Uh, we have not gone public yet. Uh, I'm with this company for about five years now. Uh, prior to this, I was working with, a, with an Indian startup, and there I got a chance to, uh, to work as one of the founding members. And prior to that, I was working with a US based. Uh, ID consultancy company, and again, this was a company which was still being run by the founder. So, what I can say is that I have got an opportunity to very closely work with the founders and uh, also uh, to look at businesses or, or run the finance of the businesses which have been able to uh, sustain over a period of time, gone through ups and downs, went through dot com bubble, then through recession, went through COVID, and they still survived very well. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are all profitable companies, and even though they have not gone public, uh, I think they are all doing very well. Uh, so, the, the topic of failed startups, I think it might sound a little gloomy, but uh, like Sir was talking about startup ecosystem, let me just start by some of the statistics. On the, uh, on the startup ecosystem in India. Recently, there was uh, there was a news on the startup ecosystem about Indian startup ecosystem, and we should all be really happy about hearing this, that India is the third largest startup ecosystem in the world. It has about 107 unicorns with a valuation of about 340 uh, US, USD, a billion USD. So that's a very good news for us. In 2021, last year, the funding which was received uh, from, from private equity and venture capital firms was about $77 billion in India. Out of that, about 37% was uh, in the startups, was received by the startups. That was about $28.8 billion. Uh, having said that, yes, currently what we are hearing, what we are hearing in the news about the startups Yes, we are going through a little tough time. The startups are going through a little tough time. And there are um, 
various reasons for that. Maybe we'll get into those reasons later. Uh, there are macroeconomic reasons. Uh, and, and then, of course, business sustainability, the, the, business, the sustainable business model, that is, of course, one of the very important reasons uh, for, uh, for, for, start, for startups to survive and to you know, as it thrives. But if we talk about the startup ecosystem in India, the business transformation in startup ecosystem startups uh, really happened in 1991 uh, with the economic policy, in, uh, which was introduced by uh, then the finance minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh. I'm sure you must have read about it, the liberalization during that time, globalization, uh, how the reforms uh, helped in getting more FDI and FII in, in, in India. And that's when uh, a lot of, we, we started hearing about a lot of companies. So I worked, in, I worked with Enforces also. I started my career with Enforces actually. Uh, 19, 1993 was when Enforces was, uh, was actually a bit for IPO. And it's like the poster child of, uh, of India when it comes to how a tech startup uh, started with some ten thousand dollars, something uh, I don't know the exact amount. Then uh, reached a uh, reached hundred billion dollar uh, valuation. Uh, but that was really the time when we started hearing about all of these companies, right? How some of these founders, uh, when they have the opportunity to really exit out and make a lot of money, they continue. Uh, Mr. Narayan Murthy, uh, he says that he had. Uh, he had a lot of opportunities in between to, uh, to to make his money and come out of Infosys, but he was he so much believed uh, in the company that he didn't do that. And those are the kind of passionate founders I have got opportunity to work with. So overall, what what I'm trying to allude to is that while the the startup ecosystem is going through a tough time, I think. Uh, the opportunities, and especially for, for students like you who are going to start your career very soon, uh, should not think that uh, it's not a viable option, it's not a lucrative option. Uh, like Sir said uh, just now, and he explained how much uh, they are doing, uh, how uh, the, the efforts they are putting in, and generally the government, Indian government, is putting in uh, to. Uh, to make sure that the the startups uh, are able to uh, to thrive in India and grow in India, uh, I think uh, I think uh, for students like you who are, who are coming up should seriously look at it uh, as as uh, as very lucrative career option. So I will just come to them. What I think makes uh, sustainable business model or makes sustainable business right or what is it that startups can look at uh, to become uh, become more sustainable? So one of the most important thing and which we, we hear a lot these days is valuation, right? And um, there are uh, it, conceptually there are so many different ways of valuing the company. Uh, but honestly, when I have I have also sat through some of the investor discussions. What I feel is that, first of all, it becomes very subjective. Valuations are very subjective. It is, uh, it, it, it becomes a lot about negotiation. And uh, one of the typical, I think, example there, uh, which always comes to my mind is Flipkart. If you, if you uh, try to study about Flipkart and the valuation, the, the number of valuation number that it had over the years, and how it keep change, how it kept changing, even between you know a six months time frame or one year time frame, it just feels that it, it is really very subjective. And as a founder uh, or, or as a as a person who's running finance uh, for for us for a company, I think valuation should not be looked at an end game. Valuation is only an only a means to an end. Like I say, that value creation is, is most important. There are many more stakeholders than just the investors. There are your customers. Uh, customers' money is always better than investors' money. That's what we 
I think as a finance profession, as someone who has studied accounting and commerce, um, that's what we have learned. Um, so uh, I think uh, uh, um, I think value creation should be the main focus rather than valuation. Secondly, over last few years, and that's probably one of the reasons what we are seeing with a lot of the startups right now who are uh, going through some some tough time, like we are hearing about by Jews and we are an academy, how they are uh, they are having these last layoffs. In the last few years, there has been a lot of lot of uh, focus on the growth, growth in terms of top line, only about the only on the revenue, and not on profitability. Last year and, and prior to that, there was not as much uh, shortage in terms of funding the the startups for receiving, and uh, because of that, everyone was concentrating on the top line. When, when when we talk about Zomato or PTM, uh, when, even when they went for listing, they were not making profit. They were they, they were never profitable, right? But I think it's time that uh, it's time that startups realize that for a sustainable business model, profit is very important. And again, this is going back to basics, going back to the fundamentals that we studied long back. That um, no, it's it's the it's the cash from operations that's very important for a sustainable business. It's the profitability that matters. And the third thing which uh, I have uh, really I think uh, being part of or, or running the finance function of some of these startups, what I have realized is that uh, the passion that the founders show for the cause of the business. That becomes that. That's what finally uh, earns you the trust of your customers, of your investors, of your employees, of, of, of public. That's where you know, that's how you really are able to maintain your reputation. These are the three things in my mind. Um, and as a finance professional, I think uh, I, I think are really important for a sustainable business model. I would like to just uh, conclude by. Seeing this uh, this line which I heard from Mark Zuckerberg, he said that we don't build services to make money. We make money to build better services. Uh, it might be a little ironic coming from a from a hardcore finance person, <laughs> but I think I think uh, when we really talk about valuation, I think the, the money that you make by the valuation or getting the money that you get from investors, it should be to really build a business. Business should not be used to, to make money. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Ashwat, especially mentioning that it is value creation, not valuation. Okay, but I have a question for you later part. That is, uh, everybody is talking about Indian startups. They are going for aggressive valuation. Okay, so we'll discuss this later. So we have our next speaker, Mr. Amit Singhal. So he is an investor. So those of you who are interested to have a startup, please listen to him carefully. Not only listen to him carefully, contact him for funds. Okay? <laughs> yeah. This is uh, thank you very much, sir. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm really privileged to have here uh, uh, Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, favorite uh, institute, favorite topic for the chapter development. Because whenever forums come, so we always think about donors rather than looking. And whenever uh, we discuss about the valuation, we always talk about the million for million. So, in fact, even the fee has been appreciated, and now we are at 18 fees per dollar. Still, we are targeting 1 million dollar as a unicorn definition. It is not like that. that five years earlier, we were talking about uh, that 6,000 crore fees is the valuation where you are treated as a unicorn. And I always think about it as well that why we compare ourselves as a unicorn in this country, where the cost of living is different. So our definition should be always be different from that. Even if we are saying that we are third 
as a roaming in the ecosystem that high speed to be that we are part of right because uh, whatever that vision we are created whatever job we are creating that is phenomenal area but having said that as per statistics yes we are at number 3 and that is very good uh, we were nowhere uh, five years ago and uh, lots of efforts were done by the government ecosystem player and other institutions so that we are here now come to the topic again uh, just uh, like uh, you can saw mention that uh, when we saw the topic so i was also uh, really surprised why we are talking about it the uh, number of topics we have been discussed with the students to inspire them to admire them to come into the ecosystem and now we are talking about it here but yes i also like the uh, discussion on why it is rising in pay however i do not agree with the topic itself because rising in pay here i have seen it rising into the ecosystem for last 14 years so first of all let's define the pay what is the pay here in south i never understand that never expectation you know unless and until you will get that Marks of 35 marks in a particular exam will be treated as a fail by the industry. In our CA exams, we are aware that we have less and less. We will have 50% in aggregation at our formula subject, so we will be treated as fail. So what is the definition is is in stock? I started my CA practice in 2006. I shut it down because I feel that there is no opportunity, and I entered into the startup ecosystem with a new startup. But then in four five years, I realized that startups do not uh, Take uh, give uh, due uh, respect to the legal and compliance, and they, they do not want to uh, pay for the support function. So it is not good to do that. It is always better to invest in other business than I become. <coughs> then I set up my own area fund, which is called Blue Venture. Now I have set up another angel fund for real time. So how I feel that because I am not continuing startup, but it should I feel that well, that has been paid because there was some aim to set it up. Still, people are asking me to sell that IP to them, and they want to buy it out. So should I agree that it was nothing? But now people are ready to buy it in ten, twenty crore rupees. So should I be treated as success? So there is no fixed definition of failure or success in the startup side. But on the same side, if you will define it like that, that you try to start a startup. Now, second point: right? What is a startup? Startup is nothing but a business which should be scalable. And you should capture a reasonable size of the market so that you will become a trouble for your competitor. So that's how I define a startup. Whenever we, as an investor, evaluate the startup, so we understand that how much market share do we capture. To so take an example of Paytm, Paytm started with a small mobile venture. So they enter into your mall as an app by only saying, "Yeah, okay, pass the card and go and get it. You can recharge your mobile phone here." Then they try to become super. Then at one moment, it was looked like maybe we create those of computer team. Then people start using other mobile apps. Then it was treated like ATM is not doing it. Then they came up with the idea of going to one thousand one hundred fifty price. Again, angel investors got a good idea. They feel that this is a success. Then again, now the share price is six fifty. Again, people are saying that ATM is great. So there is no fixed definition about the success or failure when we start up. Every six months we are Hearing uh, that Paytm is a success, then someone is saying Paytm. As an angel investor, uh, people who invested in Showcloo 15 years ago, they are making money. They make money. But after income, the entire company was sold in hundred million dollars. So the person who invested at the last billion dollar, he has not made money, but all the angel investor has made money. In Paytm, the person who invested in, in unlisted company as Paytm at 500 rupees or 300 rupees. He made money at that time of uh, IPO, and he exited at two thousand two hundred million. So whenever he will think about Paytm, he will treat it as a success. I invested three hundred rupees. I I made two thousand five hundred rupees. But for the person who owns those shares at two thousand one hundred rupees, you will say, "Yeah, this is a very good thing." Now the value is six hundred rupees. But I want to explain here in short that nothing is real. At the time of inception, it was not real. That. You are doing a research, or you are doing an experiment. It may succeed, or it may fail. So everyone is doing certain experiment. So someone is thinking that I will do something in future. Another person is doing like that. So someone is trying to create some medicine which will reduce the cancer. It may come up with the solution very successfully. It may not be successful. But now coming back to the statistics. 
Then I started my angel investment in 2015. So I started my angel investment with a company called Burger C. So I, I had an application that once I will invest the money, there may be possibility that Burger King will see them and will ask them to change that. But he showed me certain reports and he said that my IP is very strong and no one can see me. In case they will see me, Burger King will have to change its name. So that, that was the uh, report which I had and I find it uh, right and then I wrote the first check. <laughs> that is a very big company moving here. Then I invested in another company. So, the founder of Burger King came from UK, having experience of 12 to 15 years. The next company where I invested, the founder experience was of 25 years. Third, invest, the third founder was from Microsoft US, he saw the program in US, he came back to India and replicated. But now, recently, I invested in a company last year. The company name is G360. You can Google it as well. The founder is from Gopal. The age of the founder was at the time of my investment in December 2021 was 20 years old. And in fact, you will not believe I never met him till September 2022. So recently, I met him in Jaipur in one of the events. So I, uh, someone uh, came to me, he said that I want a second opinion on this startup. Will you be able to spend 15 minutes with the founder at 7.30 p.m. on Google Meet to understand what is doing? Because you, wherever you have invested in HR Tech, they did very, very well and this startup is in HR Tech. Okay. And within 15 20 minutes, I decided that I didn't have to invest in that, even we didn't know. And all the other investors are very surprised why he's not pursuing this study. He's fully stroke out. And now the valuation is 10x at what I invested. V360, you can Google it and can take that at that. So, why I explain this to you? In 2015, I have a founder who had a 10 to 25 years experience. Now, there are students who are fully stroke out. They have an opportunity to study later as well, even if they will not be able to succeed what they want to do. So, they will, they will complete the study in later stage. He is 21 years old. He can study, start again in 2020, <coughs> complete the registration of post graduation in 2027. So, if more and more people are experimenting, <coughs> so definitely the number which will look in the market for failure will be price by day. But in terms of percentage, if I go back in 2015, <coughs> where there was hardly any opportunity for us as an angel investor, hardly if there are 5,000 startups in the ecosystem and we were investing almost in all the startups because there was much opportunity and now we have 77,000 startups. So definitely it will take the same percentage, which is 10%. So most number of startups will be fail. But still the percentage will be made 8 to 10% will succeed. And again, other startups, it is not like that that they shut down. It is like that they do not uh, grow at a valuation which they were expecting. They become a normal business, they keep running it like a business. They do not able to capture the right kind of market share for the valuation. Valuation always comes once there is a lifetime value of the business itself. So if there is an independent IP of the founder and it can run independently, then the valuation arises. Unless and if there is any business or there is an IP in the business which is depending on the founder, you will never be able to uh, capture the valuation. So you will not need unless and until now you are students, but in most of the tier two, tier three city, no one knows Vijay Shekhar Sharma. You may recognize that okay, Vijay Shekhar Sharma is the founder of PTM. Everyone knows that Kolkata is the founder of Vijay Shekhar Sharma. So, uh, uh, founder of PTM. So that is how the IP which is created by PTM. PTM has itself become an IP and it will run for years, even if the founders are there. Some other people will learn the IT will have its own value. So that's how startups create its value in IT, and that it is very important that the IT should be separate from the founder, it should not be much dependent on the founder itself. So why I explain this? So that we can understand that what is failure. Failure is nothing that you were trying to achieve some valuation, you were not able to do that, or you raise some money from the angel investor and that experiment didn't work and you are not able to give back that money. So these are okay, and but in percentage term, it is far far better than earlier still because also incubators are available, accelerators are available, also head holding was available. I have seen those years where no head holding was there. Even we were not aware whether we are investing in the right startup. It is really a startup or it is a traditional business. But now everything is both of content is also available. 
everyone has seen the shark tank everyone knows how the valuation work someone among few weeks as yesterday was telling me that now our parents also know that what is startup and how the valuation arrive and now they are also able to sit on the shark uh, side and they, they are ready to, to negotiate with their children itself okay mai 5 lakh ka check deta hu but what i will get in a month time so that discussion has been started in india so lot of content is available so so again i am saying that there is no fixed formula but uh, definitely rising uh, failure is there but don't worry about that you should be part of uh, that failure or the success but you should do that and there is another statistics that we complete we are rolling out the jobs to the failed startup they are officially saying okay we want the people on this post to in case they have done some entrepreneurship in this area because they know that they will uh, uh, do the expenditure fully they know that how to spend how to manage the team because as an entrepreneur you plan everything how to manage your team how to do less expenditure how to achieve more so that's why lots of openings are there for those people and they get more service so even if you will try some startups and will try for job later on no harm in that and uh, and another aspect is whenever someone come to the angel investor and say that this is my second time entrepreneurship at the earlier startup i started i raised 250k from the angel investor and i paid i shut it down immediately because i don't think it has worth i have now another idea and i want to start again we get more funding than earlier because people are aware that now we will not repeat the mistake so he has already done the experiment so it is better always to start earlier and do best and still sometimes i like ratios of success are still far better than chartered accountant and bakki will agree with me when i did my ca qualification in 2004 hardly 5% results were there so still a success ratio of a startup is far far better than that uh, now i will conclude my discussion uh, but, but i would like to mention four five points here which are the main reasons why startups fail first foremost reason is that people themselves think about the product and they think that this is the requirement of entire world so market fit is in Biggest problem where people don't do right kind of experiment that whether they are offering something it is really useful for the other people or not, and associated to that whether the another person will buy this product or services at this cost or not, at what you are offering. So market fit of the product is extremely important whenever you are starting it. So think about it whether market fit is there or not. Second biggest problem people do not search for the product. Either they create a large team. Where no one is able to take the decision. I have seen many startups which come out from the college, four four founders are there, and they have not decided yet that who will be the CEO. They said all of us are equal stakeholders. We have not decided whatever decision we take. Either all of us are ready, otherwise we will not. And then the biggest problem in every Shark Tank episode you must have seen uh, that Shark is asking that who is CEO of it. So it's not having. Asking that is not a problem, but there should be one person who is taking that decision, or you should not start alone. You should five years later run the startup in become scalable. Who will else will be there? Who was there with you from the very first day? You can take independently. So team making, co-founder, that is very important. And associated point related to that, you should always think about the mentor or the industry expert. Sometimes you start, uh, uh, and it happens in academy. They know that uh, your professor or seniors become your mentor. Sometimes they are also required, but on the same side, industry experts should also be associated so that they can tell you about those industry dynamics and that. Unless I mean, they will be there, you will not be able to succeed, or you will do the same mistake which they did in the past. So it is always good to have mentor in the uh, early stage itself. Third point is related to price point only. Sometimes we see okay, Ola is burning. This company that are in Khata means we keep reading the news that okay he he had earned only two crore two hundred crore in the last financial year and they had earned thousand crore so, so so don't match with that the future is of unity to me unless and until you will be profitable I don't foresee that the funding is going to be happen it is true that the profitability can be little less now if no business can become profitable from the very first day that even IT is coming. And the adults will think, okay, I will be profitable from very first day. It will not be. We will have to acquire the customer, then we will become profitable one particular day. Same goes with the startups as well. So the breaking point should be clear that when we will be profitable, the 
dealer should not be such that I will buy the thing in 10 rupees and I will sell it at 8 rupees because the market demand is such that no one will buy it more than 8 rupees. Or in D2C business, we are eyeing on the invest, we are just prefer that the cost of goods sold should be one third of your sales price, one third should go to the fixed expenditure, and one third should be the net market. So, and you say, okay, I understand that my cost is 10 rupees, but I can't sell it in 20 rupees because my competitor is selling in 12 rupees. He has a scale of economy, so I can't do that. So it is more like that that the competitor is <coughs> selling it like that. So unless you will have a right price point or unity boom, you will never be able to succeed. So these are from dynamics. Uh, market research I have already covered. You will have to do the market research. Another important point. Sometimes I have seen that founders are good innovators and they are Good, operation, good in operations as well, but they are not good in startups, entire thing that they have four or five senior leadership team and they are not able to delegate or to get work from them. So the major point which I have seen is that people are good in innovation, but they are not good in commercialization. They can do the innovation. So there should be right kind of mix of things where the, they understand that how to commercialize this innovation in case. Uh, they have done something. And last point is that you should not stick with your idea. Keep pivoting. I have never seen any company who started uh, with a particular idea and still be in the same. At every point of time, you will have to learn from your mistake, keep changing the idea, keep improving it, and open <coughs> for the discussion and the feedback from your customer, your mentor, your associate, and take their advice and keep pivoting. As far as you change the idea or improvise it, it will be helpful for you or to become successful rather than failure. For concluding, last point, equity is the key in the startup. I did have another sir mentioned about me as an angel investor, that advice I am giving as an angel investor. Uh, today also I was in one session where I was listening the pitch. And one startup came there said, they say, I need 5 lakh rupees and I will give you 5% share. From my perspective, I'll I am assuming that he must be thinking that my startup will go at least up to 100 crore rupees. So it means for 5 equity, he is ready to give 5 crore rupees. Equity work, work of equity. So it means he is not valuing his equity. And I am not saying that it should be very expensive, but it should be such that even if you require some growth capital and subsequent round of revenue, you should have reasonable equity left in your head so that it will excite you to run that business. It should not be like that, that uh, like oh, you, the founder is only having 6-7% then uh, his investor has to come into the picture, give, uh, gain him some loan, token, just gain him loan and he buy his equity back to make it 11% and still 11% is the value. But at unicorn level, it still is also money. But think about that early stage where you are doing everything. I, I as an angel investor just put in 5 in the company and you are giving me 10% of the company for the lifetime. So it means for the next 100 years, I will get 10% dividend or may get 10% the value of your company by doing nothing. So you will have to value your time and effort as well. And based on that, it is not like that. But what is the valuation today? You will have to think about the future and then you should value your company. I will not take more time in case I will have more questions. Otherwise, I will keep talking. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> Yeah, thank you, Mr. Sindal, for sharing your experience, especially uh, explaining the nuances of you know startups, funding, and uh, I have a question which we can uh, which we can discuss later. That is whether you do any hand holding for the companies where you invest. Eh? So we we'll discuss that later. We have uh, Mr. Jitin Hussain. So he has a startup. So he is our alumni also. So let's hear from his experience. Thank you, thank you. Am I audible? Yes. Good evening, everybody. I think it's fantastic to be here. Uh, it was a you know, extremely uh, happy moment for me to see the campus, and I think it's come out very well. So my congratulations to everybody who was involved. I believe it's a very important topic uh, because sometimes you have to confront what appears to be true. And I, and I'm Dr. Jayanta, perhaps I think. You have decided to keep this topic because we have a bunch of impressionable and bright talent in front of us. And they may be contemplating at some stage career options, some of them quite shortly, some of them maybe in a year's time. 
And I think the way the Indian ecosystem has been moving or was moving up until now, they will all have in their mind, you know, a question that what is the right career option for me? A start of a start of the right place, a start of not the right place. In fact, I did a show of hands uh, in while I was coming, there were four or five of you with me, and I was not very surprised when I heard that not many of them wanted to work for a startup. But I can guarantee this to you that if I asked this question a couple of years back, perhaps 80-90% of this audience would have said, hey, of course, I want to work for a startup. So something has happened. Uh, it's not notional, it is apparent, it is financial, it is tangible, it is true. But the, the one thing I would like to say is when we are discussing why have Indian startups perhaps not done so well, uh, I can tell you from my context, I run a company which is actually headquartered in the US and we are invested into by Y Combinator, which is the world's largest startup investor. They invest in 1% of the world company, they reject 99% of the rest. Their acceptance rate is five times harder than Harvard. <laughs> it is what it is. And I mean, there is no other way of saying this also. Uh, they've invested into 3,500 companies till date. Airbnb is a Y Combinator company, DoorDash is a Y Combinator company, Coinbase is a Y Combinator company, Razorpay is a Y Combinator company, Zepto is a Y Combinator company. But I want to tell you, and I think building a little bit on what Anup was saying, only 150 companies out of 3,500 companies that Y Combinator, the Hollywood Y Combinator has invested in, are today valued more than $150 million. And they have made a ton of money for their limited partners. Because as a startup investor, currently I'm talking investor, I'm building on this, you don't, you don't first of all go to everybody in town. Second, you don't need to be the you know, life of everybody, which means that even if 5% of all your investments work well, and if they were to become, let's say, unicorns, so let's say Y Combinator had maybe 50 unicorns in their portfolio, their job as an investor is done. It is the, you know, the uptick that they've got on their investment is phenomenal. Now, how do we define a startup, I think is very, very critical here. So what's a startup? In my view, if I were to compare a startup versus an established company, it's a very simple understanding that at least I think about. If you are talking about a startup, it is very difficult to estimate three months later cash flow of that startup. For so long that is just called a startup. Maybe three months, maybe six months, maybe nine months. Every three, six months, things change. Now I'll give you an example which perhaps some of you, or many of you will perhaps relate. How many of you use cred or have heard of cred? When cred started, when Kunal uh, started cred, the fundamental principle of starting cred was that there are a bunch of rich people in this country, there are 5 crore credit cards in circulation, <coughs> 3 crore people in India have unique credit cards. So India is a credit underpenetrated country, but let me aggregate them on a platform. And let me help them solve a problem. People call, you know, talk about solving problems, startups solve problems. That they are paying multiple, let's say, payments every month. Why can't I aggregate them on one platform? And then I will think about what business I will build. Because that's exactly what happened. So they spent a ton of money, got all of you on the platform, all of us on the platform, gave you cash back, and everybody was laughing that what is this sorcery? Yeah, what, what is happening? Why is somebody paying me to pay my bill? Now, Paytm did cash back. A lot of business in this you know, country has been built on cash back, you know, cost of acquisition of building customers. But if you see the life cycle of credit, first they launched that product, then they started building a D2C marketplace. Today, perhaps they are the largest marketplace for D2C in India. They started monetizing it. Then they started figuring out that, look, we have some rich people, which coding code is a, let's say, relative term, but we have financially sound people on our platform. Why can't we make them, let's say, peer to peer lending investors? And we will start monetizing that. Tomorrow they may, now they have gotten into UPI. So within a span of three years, they have launched four unique businesses if you think about. So predictability has started a very difficult, given you can monetize it. Now I think that is a massive challenge, if you ask me. A lot of startups which have well and truly failed. What is failure? I think Amit made a very you know, interesting point of how to define failure. In a classic startup sense, if you set out doing something, and if you could not achieve what you thought would be true for your customers, for your employees, and for your shareholders, because I think this holy trinity should gain if a business has to win. Housing.com. Customers were super happy. A drone is coming to, let's say, take a picture, you will you know, buy a house. 
Okay, great. Employees are being paid handsome salary. Shareholders were fretting what's happening. Right? Doesn't work. And I don't need to belittle. I'm, I'm just giving case studies so that people can relate. Right? So customer should be happy. Employee should be happy. Shareholders should be happy, which means financial gains should come out. Which is why people build business. I can tell you as a founder, founders are dreamers. They want to change the world. In Barat, these are the people who do actually change the world. When somebody launched Gmail back in the day, he would have been scoffed at or she would have been scoffed at. But today, if somebody snatches Gmail from you for one minute, so somebody dreamt at some point that we will change the world. WhatsApp as well. WhatsApp as well. Exactly. So startups are dreamers and dreams come at a cost. Dreams cannot come without a cost. And not every dream can become, you know, Google. So people who enter the startup world, be it as an investor, be it as an employee, or be it as a founder, they should have incredible, you know, let's say conviction in what they're doing. They should have incredible composure. They should have incredible risk-taking ability. They should be comfortable in what they're doing. And they should have incredible resilience because you know what failure is a, is a given. It does happen. But it is not about how much you fail. It is about how fast can you get up from a failure and then start building what you thought you should build. Because you know not every idea that you would think which germinates in your head will actually get executed the way you think it can get executed. So your resilience, your ability to let's say think on of feet and then maybe pivot, as Amit rightly mentioned, it is you know it's incredibly important to building businesses. Now, if I were to compare this with an ITC, you know ITC sells cigarettes, you know ITC sells FMCG, and you know every three months they will just report that. Perhaps they will launch another district. Perhaps they will launch another snack type. They will say healthy snack. But essentially, their categories are very well defined. Right? They're not entering into some straight geography overnight without, let's say, a value boom in the market because they're an investor driven company, they're a listed company, everything has to be measured. Startups don't have that you know, inhibition. This inhibition or lack of inhibition also exposes them to risk. It is normal. Now, people who don't understand this, they will, they should perhaps not enter, neither as an investor, nor as an employee, nor as an owner. <coughs> but people who understand this, they're able to navigate those waters with a reasonable amount of conviction, and they're able to take success as well as failure in this right. Because it is important to be balanced in both. And I can tell you from experience, like my previous venture. We were one of the few fintech lending companies in India to have track profitability. Because I think at least, you know, after, and I didn't start my career as an entrepreneur right out of college. So those romantic stories do exist. But there are very few Mark Zuckerbergs, let's be clear, right? It does help you when you go through the rigor of corporate world, you know how to run a business, you know how to run people, you know how to run investors, you know what is legal, you know what is compliance, you understand the value of governance, and then you start building, you perhaps have some yes up your sleeve, right? You're, and, and, and there's always another side. I mean, somebody could build a great SaaS business out of college. It has happened. You know, it happens over there. But I think fundamentally what is lacking or what has hurt some of Indian startups is, first of all, people think of a product which they think in their head, founders hallucinate products. They think, I may think I have a product it should be accepted by everybody and everybody should pay for it. And I start building that without even checking with somebody who is not an acquaintance, not a friend, not a family. So that validation I'm not going to do. I'm not going to go to the market, check with people, hey, will you buy this? If you buy this, will you buy it for free? Or will I have to price 10 for 8? Can I price 10 for 30? And if you can't, then writing is on the wall. Then again, you're hallucinating. You want to do something which the world is telling you you should not, but you still want to do it with eyes open. Then God bless you. So I think this is something which has happened. And the world is driven by greed and fear, as Bob Buffet says. In 2000, there was a dot-com bubble. People forgot it by 2005. In 2009, there was a housing bubble. People forgot it by 2013. I can lay a bet people will forget 2022. And in five years' time, maybe three years' time, maybe two years' time, all of you may will again be raising your hand. Because the opportunities that a disruptive business can provide to young minds to exercise their thought process is far more liberal than a startup. It is normal because there is no bureaucracy. It has its pros, it has its cons, sure. But I think the ability to attract young people and aggressive mindset is far more you know, demonstrable in a startup. Now, how you use that to your advantage is the skill of the founder. And the founders are accountable, and it's an accountability business. Right? So that one product market fit and research as to what you what you want to get into, will the people accept it? Will I have to run this always at loss? I think should be very, very clear and out of the window. 
Second is, I agree with Amit, even if you're not making money today, let's say, for example, Thread did not, Thread is not. I mean, Thread is just an example. Paytm is not, Zomato is not. And most Indian, you know, uh, hyper-scale startups are not making money because for them to have scaled in a hyperbolic fashion, they like to spend money. It's normal. It's like CapEx that somebody would have had to do to set up a refinery, pay their lines. But we don't talk about it. Because it is a lines. Because that's a, you know, when, when a refinery set up, hundreds of crores, look at Geo. I mean, billions of dollars were borrowed. Right? Even now they're borrowing. But they are able to monetize it. So can a startup also do that with a scale? Average seat check in India is what? It's going up now. Sometimes even more than that. In the valley, Silicon Valley is different. Right? The thing is that when you start building a business, you should have some direction by which you can start monetizing it at reasonable scale. One of the world's biggest investor, which is Paul Graham, founder of Y Combinator, he talks about something called default ally. So I'll tell you what default ally is. And I think that's the biggest bane of Indian startups or even global startups because they're not owned. Europe startups have are feeling the pressure, you know, US startups are feeling the pressure. So Paul Graham says this famously, default ally is, I have $100 in my bank. I make $1 revenue. I spend maybe $2 in cash to get that $1 revenue when I start the business. Which means every month I'm losing money, but I'm left with only 100. So with that $100 in the bank, assuming nobody else gives me money, for how long can I remain alive? And do I have the ability to turn the ship? I can see the iceberg. Do I have the ability to turn the ship in a direction where that two of expense goes less than one of income? So either you grow the income or you can control the expense. Chances are you have to grow the income. Because expense will only grow in a growing business. Right? How fast you do that will help you decide whether you will remain default alive or whether you will go out with a betting goal every six months to invest. Because mind you, equity is the most expensive form of financing that you can ever take account of. Most expensive form of financing. So as founders, it is your responsibility to ensure that you don't go around begging. And I'm not using you know, derogatory terms. I'm just saying it's a matter of fact. You meet 100 investors, perhaps two of them will say yes. It is what it is. Only 1% companies that are incepted are genuinely given venture capital cash, not seed money, not like somebody giving you 5, 10, 20. But venture capital do not invest in more than 1% companies. Just 1%. So it is difficult, right? So understanding your economics and how you will make money is super critical. And I think in India, just like in the Western world, some companies have been guilty of not doing that. But I think people like us who are now building this with the advantage of a rear view mirror, maybe it's simpler for me to say this today. In 2020, the Fed had opened the you know, front gates and there was easy liquidity available. Maybe people like us would have also raised money and done some valuation. Every six months, valuation was changing, <laughs> as Rati mentioned. It is, it is true. But I think the onus is on the community to decide what they want to do and on the founders to understand why have they started the business. Have they started the business to sell it in two, three years? Have they started the business to, you know, Make it a fundamentally sound business. How is the constitution of that company created? What are the problems that you know the company trying to solve? Is it monetizable? These are questions that you should think about if you want to enter the startup business. And don't just fall for that, you know, that company is capital. I think the ecosystem is also guilty. When was the last time Economic Times reported that this company had this revenue and this profitability? Never. Have you ever read it? It just says so and so raised so and so at so and so valuation. That's it. That was the narrative. Right? So I fundamentally believe that this what is happening in this country or rather the globe. Because you know, even in the valley, tech companies are today valued at 70% of what they were before, let's say, this crash. So fundamentally, what this will do is it will force people to go back to the drawing board. It will allow investors to ask little, little questions which they ought to have asked in the first place. Because they also want an exit. You know, every investor wants you know, material gains. It's normal. If it's a venture capital fund, you're setting, you have let's say a five, six, seven year repayment period. Flat. Otherwise, your LPs come knocking and say, hey, you take my money, there's the money. You can't say, I'll give you money by 25 years. Nobody will wait. So the thing is, this entire ecosystem has to mature. And it is normal. It is not the most, most mature business. Other businesses have had, let's say, 100 year, 200 year, 500 year advantage. Startups have not. So this will fundamentally alter how startup founders think, how investors think, how employees think. And I think we come out strong. So fundamentally understanding the product, if you want to run a business or if you want to join a business, be clear about the product. Be clear that there's a real problem being solved, which can be genuinely monetized. Be clear that you know the structure of the company is clean. 
I mean, there have been governance issues in this in, the, in this ecosystem. Some unicorns have actually shut down. There is a company called Zenimo in Singapore. It was a unicorn. It is on the verge of being shut down. Hundreds of millions of dollars have gone into drink because there are governance issues. Right? It has happened in India also. I mean, there are a few companies which I don't want to name them. But it is what it is, right? So I think fundamentally these problems did seep into Indian startups as well. Because the world is driven by greed and fear. And it just requires a little bit more equilibrium, which I think always sometimes mean like as individuals or societies or you know, corporate societies, founding societies, we need a rap on another sometimes to understand where we're going wrong. But the strong amongst us will only emerge stronger. And I think young people like you should believe that you can become stronger and don't get derailed by what's happening. Just learn from it and use it to your advantage because those people will. And don't do to a negative reason because they don't take you anywhere. Anymore. So I think that's where I would like to close my current state. Sounds good. I believe in what he has done. Always experiment on other people's experiences. He did not start the startup at the beginning. He worked for some years and then. Okay, before I, uh, you know, open this to the floor, uh, I just have one more thing to say. That is, uh, I don't believe in that failure. So that reminds me, you know, in class also I give a lot of examples from movies. That reminds me of a famous movie. Many of you have seen. Uh, sorry? No. Uh, catch me if you can. So what is the tagline? Once two mice fell into the mill, so one had given up. And the other mouse kept on swimming, swimming, swimming and converted the brick into cream. Came out of that. Okay? So I don't believe in that failure. So if you keep on trying, definitely there is a success. Okay? Please open the floor if you have any question. So there are industry experts. Please. Good evening, panelists. I have Krishna Kanta for the past few years. Thank you so much for this insightful session, of course. Uh, my question right now, before actually stating my question, right now we all have a perception that the topic was of failures of startup, but we'll go as that it's a transition from failure to the success. In coordination with that, uh, the global recession is the recent uh, market threat which we all are seeing. So as investors or maybe as a startup, how can we actually strategize our position when we are actually going for uh, our valuations? There are already many big listed companies in startups. What's your opinion that how we should actually go for a sustainable business in terms of a small scale startup or maybe a large scale? Oh, so I just wanted an opinion from all the families. That's it. Sure. So definitely, uh, there is one of the European session and as uh, uh, Jitin rightly mentioned it may go for the number of years as well, and it can be for only a few months as well. We don't know. But definitely, this is a year of little survival for the existing startups. But uh, I will use the same story which I used with the COVID as well. Uh, uh, right now, as a student, you will have to start a startup. You are not at the stage where you are in the middle of something and uh, you are. Uh, you will be somewhere uh, which will kill your startup. So this is the right time. So the session normally happens between six months to eighteen months time. So every cycle we have seen the same happens in 2016 as well, where no one was funding to the startup. And this recession is for everything for the state entity and uh, it is global recession. So definitely that is there. We can't deny that. But you will have to assume that this will have a period and that will be over. In case you have an existing startup and you are running, so definitely as uh, as an investor as well, we are suggesting our portfolio company to uh, keep the cash safe rather than focus on growth. Think about that that how much runway can be left, and he explained very well what is the, that is about how much period is being left. In case you have only five months runway, make it for eight months or nine months by various ways. But don't focus much on growth. But this is a narrative survival. So recession will not uh, impact your research or your experiment. So whatever you want to do, 
you should start it. And sometimes the recession helps as well. In case there is a recession, so there may be possibility if you will come up with solution which is less expensive as others, so maybe that will right fit for certain territory as well. May not, may not be for India, but for some other country. So it is not like that. That recession will impact large on the startup. And every time, whenever there is a downside, maybe of COVID or, or maybe of recession, that will hire more on the large corporate as compared to less. So that's how I don't think uh, at this stage where you are, uh, recession should have any concern. Yeah, if I may just add to this, I think I'll just give one line answer. World's biggest businesses were built during the session. The Airbnb was launched during a couple of years. Google actually, which I mentioned, was launched during that say recessionary phase because the recession teaches you like you know, adversity teaches you like nothing else. So when people decide to do something against the current and they have the wherewithal, and once they start getting tailwinds, because tailwinds will come. So the biggest businesses actually get built with a strong foundation during the session, and then they get to take off when everything else is taking off. Yeah, uh, so uh, just to understand your question uh, in depth. I think you have to you have asked two things, right? One is the strategy at the growth stage, the startups with the growth stage, and another is the those startups in the early stage. They've just have developed something, they've not entered the market, they're not listed fully, just there at the early stage of the business. So what Amit answered that is for the growth stage because this isn't only for six months or something, and you have to keep on innovate so that you will survive through and then you come up. But what I interpret from the early stage point of view, so actually the strategy will vary is actually what type of product you are dealing. If your innovation is incremental or it is a radical, your strategy will change. And once your product or once your innovation will come into market, is it disruptive or it is sustainable? So sustaining. So based on that also your strategy will change. So first you have to decide what innovation is the increment if you are playing with incremental innovation and in the market there is no competitor and you are the only one then you you need not to worry about the recession you have to uh, you have to move because you definitely will sustain because there is no much competitor your market is still there right and if you are making a radical innovation and still there are so many alternative products then also you have to worry about so strategy and approach will depend which quadrant of incremental and uh, uh, radical of innovation and disruptive and sustaining market you are playing. So you have to develop this quadrant according you have to set up your strategy. And if it is early stage, I think you did not have to worry about the market, only you are worried about the potential customer or those for whom you are developing the solution, how it is going to fit the requirement and your team and the perseverance you have to make sure at a very, very early stage. You, you should not uh, get disturbed about the decision and something this kind of problem. So, so there was talk about uh, value creation uh, in the startups. So, as a co founder, I feel like in India, there has to be more value created uh, for a startup. Because, for example, like long back, uh, there was just a scrub on Shark Tank in USA. It was just in the shape of a smiley. And uh, that scrub, if we were to launch in India, it would be replicated the very next day. Now, the protection that we have in the uh, form of IP and trademarks. Uh, so, for a for a startup which is just starting out, how executionable is it to go and uh, conduct multiple lawsuits and exercise those IP rights and trademark rights? So, or uh, like as a startup community, how can we ensure that the innovators and the startup owners they get the full value for their money? Because that, uh, like that example, that scrub is doing uh, millions of dollars in revenues per day. So, how can we get that to Indian startup owners as well? Let me attend. Yeah, please. See, uh, this patent or IP or copyright or trademark, whatever things, mostly these are the geographic, right? Limitation is there. 
so uh, if you are if you foresee the potential of that product in indian market then you have to protect uh, in the as for the indian uh, or you have to go for the pct kind of things right to multiple in different multiple countries but for the startup so when you are doing uh, when you are uh, going for any startup so that you must have some solution right some innovation so if it is ip based you must be aware about ip component during the ideation stage if you are going to uh, exercise this ip at the later stage after developing the product then i think definitely you will miss the bus and you will definitely lose lots of money and valuation wise it will come down so this that is actually very very critical for each and every founder or innovator while designing your solution you should have this ip component you should know what how you are going to what is the ip component how you are going to protect it and everything you should have in your mind and also the planning and next thing is that uh, uh, you should understand the geographic in indian context which is patentable which is protectable which is not protected like in india software is not protectable right but in usa software you can uh, you can protect it so <coughs> patent it so you have to also understand this kind of differences and uh, uh, more more importantly the uh, ip in indian context ip based startups are very 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 less and uh, those are product based innovations only you will find there is a competitive advantage and they will survive but for that software related or kind of a uh, uh, your uh, uh, e commerce business related startups actually it is easily uh, uh, replicable uh, it's easily uh, uh, you will find competitors because the moment olex came another way the uh, other e-commerce business came so you have to fight through you have to survive through that competition <coughs> next i think there is one <coughs> <coughs> So, thank you. It's been very interesting uh, on this visibility. So, my question is: early startup usually they favor trying to work on undefined problems to avoid failure. They usually favor like YouTube once was a dating app, now it's a video sharing app. So, I want to know why and when and how uh, startups favor like kind of the guests and a lot of experiences in the tech world system. So, I want panel to have this some kind of anecdote and stories how during the difficult time and when. They actually move from one business to another business, so it's very undefined. So how how is the journey? I want uh, some story or something to navigate that. So what is your background? Are you joining MBA? Uh, so I've been working for a few startups, uh, big startups. Before that, what did you do? I, I was a system engineer. So why not system engineer be MBA? <laughs> uh, because uh, yeah, nice answer. <laughs> I want to know like uh, let, let me add because yeah, I, yeah. see uh, if you will understand the story of uh, consider two examples right one is apple right the company which is the lead in the mobile phone things and consider another any startup actually the two principle work behind these things for the Change from one to the another things. One is, are you developing a solution which is pool based or a push based, right? <coughs> so if your solution is a kind of a uh, pool based, right? <coughs> that means you are designing a solution or your startup is focusing on a real problem exist and which is evident, which is very prevalent. That means your pool based. That means you have seen it and you found their suffering. To solve that, you have you came up, you discussed, and you developed a solution that you are selling. So there is no much effort, and majority of the startups following this. But another one is called push based. They are actually they are already have a much of experience. They have lots of money. They have raised lots of investment, like Apple. They have R and D. They have the big data. They know how to utilize the artificial intelligence and the machine learning. So they synthesize the data and they discovered aspiration, which is. Person is suffering, but they have not not realized it. So they have guessed the aspiration part. Then they convert that aspiration to a problem statement and they devise a solution. Then they market it. See, this is the aspiration, and we have these things. So 
it depends on the, the, what strategy what's the level you are and that decide actually your change from one uh, your your innovation of the domain right like you you have changed from system engineer to mba right because you found that okay if you will change that then this is the kind of uh, opportunity cost or something you must have figured it, figured it out right that's why you have spent 2 hours 2 years and spent that this much of money taken loan for uh, for this this program so this is called opportunity cost so this realization this prediction a majority of the startup founders have they develop it and this development this experience come with uh, failure yeah a very good evening to the panel uh, i am ayush agarwal from the batch of 24 and basically my question is uh, that uh, rightly amit sir said that initially startups don't have those profits and revenues so i wonder how a venture capitalist or any investor think that i want to invest this in startup and i want to invest in any of the startup and what are the revenue models that they usually follow while valuing in their startups going forward Million dollar question. This is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so your question is that if uh, uh, there is a non-profitable business and there are also why we are finding that and how we are deciding that why should be fine. So when do we go to the bank for the loan? At the time when we have enough money in our bank account, or at the time when we have a shortage of funds? So the same goes with the startup side. Right? So you have a business plan, and you are showing to an investor, and I keep saying that that to get funding from the initial stage investor is much easier as compared to the later stage because at the later stage you will have to do show the actual number. While at the time of ideation or at the time of uh, seed funding you will have to show the projection, which is a kind of dream. मैं ये करूँगा इतना बड़ा करूँगा इंडिया में तो बड़ा आसान काम है तो जब मैं जल्दी इन्वेस्टमेंट करता हूँ तो वही हेड करता हूँ कि भाई यू हैव स्टार्टेड समथिंग एंड विल डू समथिंग बेस सो व्हाट हैपेंस यू क्रिएट ए प्रोजेक्शन ऑन वेरियस एजेंशंस यू एस एन इन्वेस्टर डिस्काउंटेड बाय वेरियस फैक्टर सो यू विल से ओके दिस बिजनेस कैन बी 500 करोड़ वी डिस्काउंटेड एंड दैट 500 करोड़ मे बी आफ्टर 7 इयर्स और 8 इयर्स सो देयर आर प्रोजेक्शन एंड यू विल शो and uh, just in rightly mentioned that there will be certain expenditure at the beginning which will be over fixed in the nature so you will have an expenditure let's say take an example first month whenever you will start the operation the revenue uh, is 2 rupees your expenditure is 5 rupees and your uh, net loss is 3 rupees then the business plan is reflecting that yes this loss will reduce every month 3 rupees become 290 280 then it is reducing every month and there is a stage where it is a break even month so we always calculate whether this break even month is after coming to three four years because we do not invest in those businesses where the break even is coming very late because we expect that the economical situation can be changed geographical situation can be changed but if we feel that yes the break even is coming within 18 months or so around that so we are asking it that what is the net loss of these 18 months adding all the figures 300 290 and assume that this is the fund required for the business to reach at a break even point so that's how we calculate the fund requirement and many founders do this mistake as well they say okay my revenue will be 2 rupees my expenditure will be 5 rupees and i expect you to fund me 5 rupees because i am confident that i will spend 5 rupees but i am not confident whether i will earn 2 rupees or not so that is not the right close to your right strategy to raise the fund you should not add up all the expenditures you should raise the fund for your net loss so unless and until you are confident that by spending 5 rupees at least you will raise 2 rupees by investor will uh, uh, believe on those assumption so that's why we try to fund those losses and calculate that what should be the right valuation so we as an engine company we evaluate okay after 18 months you will reach at a stage where you will be at break even and your top line may be Let's say ten crore rupees in a year. So at that time, if you are B2B SaaS business and you are lifetime value of the customer is X, based on that assumptions we calculate. Okay, as per comparative, what can be the potential valuation of that business after eighteen months? So we divide it by ten. Simple formula, and that 
sometimes it looks very old white and bank is only giving 5% interest to you while we are expecting 1000% return on your investment and as uh, Jatin rightly mentioned we take an NPA percentage in our head bank has somewhere around 4-5% but as an angel investor we assume that 90% of our startup will be NPA so only 10% will pay and we try to make that 10% every startup so that's how we do Okay, so we assume that the valuation of this company will be 50 crore rupees after 18 months. So we give a valuation of 5 crore rupees as an angel. So if you are raising 50 lakh rupees from us, we will take 10% equity at a valuation of 5 crore, assuming that after 18 months I may take an exit at a 50 crore rupees valuation. Now it is dependent upon my luck whether I will be able to exit or not, or if I will be able to exit whether I will get 2x, 3x, 5x, or maybe 100x. So as uh, you can also mention about one statistics that Y Combinator is the largest investor in the world. So you will not believe as an angel I have invested in around 37 companies till now and three of my companies have been given Y Combinator companies. So they have invested in that. So you can also make a study on them. Like first company which become Y Combinator is in Fido. They did very well. Advantage Color and Red Fish Labs. These are three portfolio companies where I wrote the first check in this company at a very minimum valuation, less than a million dollar valuation. It's four five crore rupees that I invested, and now they have become hundred million valuation company. And those companies have recovered my loss of another thirty four companies. And still, I would say that other thirty four companies will not pay me anything. Someone will pay the principal. Someone will pay me two three x kind of return. But now I am at a position where I have to use this career as full time to do an investment for me and others. Now you will have to also understand that as an investment, investor, I was putting my own money. Now as a funding, uh, funding partner of a fluid, I am investing others' money and we get profit sharing out of that. So whenever you will the news that I am running a fund of 50 crore rupees, it is not like that, that, that is my money. That is other money which I am managing and I will get a profit sharing out of the profit which I will make sure that they will earn. So that's how this entire value works. I am hoping that you go to your answer. Sure sir. Uh, sir, I have a follow up question. Sir. Sure. So like we see the, how recessions and uh, <coughs> that we miss happens, it happens in the economy. So how no, I, I will answer only one point. Uh, are you following stock market as well? You see some channels like CNBC, etc. Yes. What uh, big player like Rakesh Shubhamala or whoever is there, what they say that you should buy the stocks at the time when they are at the peak or at the time of bottom? Buy the low stock at the bottom now. So, ITC, you should have bought the ITC when it was 180 rupees uh, one year back, or should you buy at 350? You may buy for the same back, but at the same time, if you could have invested in SBI state of India. 190 rupees in year 2020 when COVID was happening and it was a peak. You, uh, in, uh, as of now, I believe it is at 580 or something like that, around that. So the people have been TX in the two months by only investing in State Bank of India, which is the largest bank of India. So it, it is the similar thing to us as well. So the recession helped us to set the right valuation with the startups. So in year back, the expectation of the valuation by the founders were extremely high. Uh, even uh, we were like some ideas, but they were saying, okay, we will not give you active expansion. Now they are also clear that lots of people are not investing. We are getting the investment at the right uh, valuation. So we believe that our wealth will be maximized up. Right? So we are investing more at that time. So six months ago, when we were clear that recession is about to come, we stopped our hand and we were not investing at that time. So that is that is the role of fund manager. And that's why people go to the professional like us who Ensure because we keep checking that as an angel investor who is working in some company and the investment in startups is a side business, he, he can't track that, that how the economy is working and how it's supposed to be work. We know also wrong, but 24 into 7, we are thinking like that that what is the right time to buy, what is the right time to exit. If I'm into the, any particular sector, is it, is it a time to exit? Sometimes people debate, I exited Nima Shoes at very early stage. <laughs> I will think that it is for the right time. So there is no right time or wrong time. The main point is that 
we invest at the right time and we exit at the right time. That is our role. So the decision for us, like an investor, it is the right time to invest. And we are investing aggressively at the time. See, I have a question for Baki. He just pointed out, don't you think that the India special valuations are very aggressive? I think that was understood also that on that uh, last year, especially last year, the kind of funding we've seen. So I think that vision is also about demand and supply, right? Last year, the kind of funding we've seen coming into India, that has helped the startups, right, in, in terms of uh, valuation. But then again, we come to this year, this, uh, we're calling it fund, funding winter now. Not enough funding happening, we're talking about recession. Uh, and like I was saying, there are a lot of macroeconomic factors. US interest rates are at all time high. Why is the depreciating compared to uh, compared to USD? Because everyone wants to now invest in USD. Uh, they don't want to invest in India. So I think it's, it's a lot about demand and supply. And we saw some uh, overvaluation in the past year. Which is probably getting corrected now. So um, I, I would say that it's uh, it's really about uh, demand and supply. Any further question? Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Pranit Tapia from the Bayam Twenty Four. Uh, it's a great thing that uh, a country is having more and more startups start starting up every year. So my question is uh, related to this: that uh, a lot of there is a difficulty in valuation. As Man said that there is a lot of difficulty in uh, valuation of the company over the period of time. It is changing, and there is also a fact that uh, the profitability of the country uh, for the of the companies have been uh, not up to the mark. So can we say that? I mean, uh, is there any possibility that in near future we might be heading towards a uh, startup valuation bubble? Or if yes, then how uh, how would it be diff diff different from the dot com bubble and housing bubble that we have seen in the recent past? Uh, I think we are right now going through uh, a bit of startup valuation uh, bubble first. Bubble has probably already happened in the last year. Uh, so we are seeing that valuations are uh, valuations are getting corrected now. Uh, a lot of companies are now under too much pressure, and and the the layoffs that I was talking about, uh, we heard about these layoffs in Baidu's an academy. Why is it happening? They are not profitable right now, and they are getting a lot of pressure from their investors. They are not able to get enough funding. They have been burning a lot of cash. So the, the valuation bubble burst is probably happening right now. Having said that, uh, from everywhere, what I hear and what I understand is that India is at a very bright spot compared to other countries. So uh, I think it's time for some of the startups to wait and watch, to manage the show for some time until uh, we start get, getting back the funding. Uh, but yeah, we are definitely seeing correction and uh, definitely seeing the first valuation burst right now, bubble burst. Thank you. I want to add. Yeah. Uh, so, what do you think about the valuation burst or something like that? I, I do not understand this terminology itself. So, I was thinking when you were asking this question that which of the startups in past one year or two years? Who has seen the down wrong? Can we mention some name? Except for you know, uh, uh, and then uh, there are specific reasons. COVID was there and uh, people who are not using that. And there may be 10 other issues as well. And there are some companies who shut down because of their uh, governance issues. Like how pay similar groups of humans uh, and you are doing more than another example. And there are few names. But what is valuation? We can compare it with with the market cap in the listed entities. So in case the Reliance interest share is of 1500 rupees, you will multiply by the number of shares and you will be able to get market capitalization. 
then you will calculate it like price to earning ratio if there are certain ratios which you will evaluate. The same goes with startups as well. So sometimes if you are the only player in the market and you are capturing a large size of the market, definitely you will get a particular multiple of your lifetime value of the business. So definitely because we say, okay, India has a 130 million, 130 million, 130 crore population in India and you will, you are capturing this and you have a potential to get this. So I am valuing you. So if you will use the same growth, you will be able to capture that market. But suddenly after six months or eight months, they realize that there are two others players in the market who are doing the similar thing. So there will be possibility you will not be able to do that. Now I am not valuing you this much. So you were expecting that yes, my valuation was hundred million dollars. Now once I will grow two times, so investor will give me four hundred million valuation. But now what is happening? You are growing at two x rate, while the investor is giving you one point two two five x multiple, or your valuation has become one twenty five. Do you consider it as a down round, or do you, will you say okay, uh, this is loss making money? What has been changed? You are growing the business and valuation is good. Increasing as per your expectation, I don't think that is going to be happen. But Raki rightly said that one of the expectations were very high, so the valuations multiple were very high. So in case you are getting let's say 10x of the beta or 100x of the beta, now people realize that the growth at which pace it was expected that is not going to be happen. So it should be 40x of the beta or it may be some other x of the beta. But I have not seen that we are, we are saying okay the valuation of the company was one million and suddenly next month we are saying okay that valuation was one million, the should be valued at 100 million. So that is honestly that is not going to be happen. So the expectation versus actual may be different, but uh, don't the worry about the valuation. And at the beginning itself, I mentioned that build the business based on the business rather than thinking about the valuation. It doesn't make any difference for you uh, if you will uh, give 90% of your stake to a investor and make a $1 million valuation company versus you give only 10% of your stake or 20% of your stake and make $150 million valuation company. At the end of the day, you will get 100 million out of 1 billion as a 10% shareholder of the company. And in another case, if you are holding 80% of 150 million company, you will get 120 million. So, this is only news items where you will say, okay, I have become uniform, etc. That's why I said that we should not compare us with the US. You should look how much value I expected from the business, how early I can get that, whether I will get that. So, overall valuation of the company doesn't matter. It matters that how much shares you own in the overall scenario. And I can tell you that there are companies raising money even in this market at higher valuations. In fact, we also raised money last month at higher valuations. So there is always another side, and I think the commentary just becomes too much negative. And I think you should just distance yourself from valuation because your question itself was valuation all over again. Because that is so well ingrained in your mind that that is the only holy grail that you think is true. And maybe it is not. So if SBI went from 600 to 190, did it mean that the Apex Bank of the country eroded 70% in value? It's just that the stock markets for that period of time decided to value that stock at 30%. But it bounced back. Similarly, I fundamentally believe that some sanity will prevail and provided businesses can generate some traction, which is reasonable, then you will see this come back. And to be an investor, we as an investor are responsible for creating this limit around that, uh, that uh, uh, the valuations are down because we want to acquire the companies at the world valuation. So that's why we are creating it to your investor. It is not like the is much better. It's just the commentary. It's an opportunistic time for him to invest. The best time for him to invest, yeah? Yeah, I think it's a good buy now. <laughs> <laughs> but I think his question is from the other side, right? Because he would, he would like to get funds. So, from that way. Yeah. If your idea is good, you are doing, working on some niche idea and uh, you can justify that, yes, it's the right opportunity for the investor. The investors are ready to invest. Sell the product. Yeah. yeah, any further question? Well, sir, you gave me number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, definitely, the other thing is, uh, do you do some hand holding? That is also so. This question is very important. That I have been back uh, to this question. Do angel investor hand hold the startups? So, answer is no. 
most of the angel investors work the extra but they are too busy in their life and that is the side income for them they are investing some money which is surplus for them and they are investing in your company and they expect you to nerve all them so that is 90 percent but because i am into the ecosystem since 2007 and i am learning so that is my passion so definitely i do not invest in any company unless and until i feel i can do the value addition with that company but i am sure that i fall in that 10 percent category and he must other people must have raised the money from the angel investor i'm sure no one must be asking to the founders that what is happening they they, they just write the check and return it off from the next day itself they always think if you are coming back then okay so they always put the surplus money and you should know how to run your business nobody knows it no one can otherwise they can run it because okay. <laughs> i went to the uh, part and i am uh, on the side where i went to them that's why i only invest in those startups because i can tell them and uh, one other point uh, because i am into the b2c space and i largely invest in direct to consumer physical items and he rightly mentioned about the threat you will not believe any b2c brand whosoever want to launch a brand in india can launch the brand without credit because only the credit is not an e-commerce platform that is a sampling platform that is the replacement of the sampling earlier what was happening people were coming to college or the uh, corporates to do the sampling or to do the sampling now what they are doing they are only targeting those niche three crore people who have a credit card right kind of civil score so DUC can go to the credit can ask them that okay my product is of thousand rupees per but I will sell this product and in most of the scheme, you can say, uh, uh, see that they will not uh, allow you to order more than one product. If you want to add, uh, order that, so the discount will be only for the single product. It is not like Amazon that whatever discount is there, you can uh, apply on any quantity. So it is a kind of sampling platform where the DTC brands want you to try it out. Then after testing it, in case you like it, you can order the subsequent uh, product from Amazon. So that is a sampling platform for those three products. Yeah. Any further question? Okay. Good evening, panelists. I'm Kanishma from the Batch of 24. So there have been certain IPOs recently, and their performance in the stock market has gone down. So, do you think there has been a haste in this regard, or was there was that a right decision from these companies? Can you please uh, talk about that? So, did that happen only for the startups or, or for the other corporates as well? Other other corporates as well. So, we are discussing about startups. So, that is the problem of uh, stock again. So, say we didn't have right kind of uh, measurement. So, what should be the right kind of valuation for the companies who are coming up with an IPO? So, an IPO was decided by the market only. So, stock market works like a demand and supply. So, the company offered a share at in an IPO at a particular point, price point, and people subscribe that. It means people were ready to buy that stock at a particular uh, price. And then, when the advisor or their advisor didn't explain them whether they should apply for this IPO at a particular point, price point or not. So basically, that is not the problem of startups. So it, uh, it is not related to startups. So that's why I would say, don't worry about that. That is the problem of SEBI. And sooner or later, there will be guidelines, and those problems will also be resolved. Uh, like, uh, yeah. Thank you. And regarding my question, I would like to make you more to the types allowed. So sometimes we ask this question that how to value my startup, I am at idea stage, one investor is saying I will give you a valuation 5 crore rupees while my mentor or my senior founders are saying that you should not value your company less than 50 crore rupees. So that is a dilemma where we were never able to reach at the stage where we can value our company. So that should be the right valuation. So now there are certain instruments available in the market and I am sure those must be in your curriculum as well. Like earlier we have read about the equity share and preference shares only. But now there is a uh, note which is called convertible note in India. So let's understand from US perspective first. So in US this is called safe note. Safe is nothing, it is not the safe the safety of an investor. The full form of safe is simple agreement for future equity. What does it mean? It means that investor give you a loan 
which will be in your book to be treated as a loan. Till that time, it will be converted into equity. So once that some VC fund or some person who know how to evaluate or some numbers were achieved, at that time it will be converted into equity by giving a certain kind of coupon rate discount. So you may say, okay, I will give you 1.5% or 2% per month discount. So till that time I will raise next funding, you will get a discount because you gave me an advance as a loan. And it is shown that I am I am not going to pay you the money back at any point of time. It will definitely be converted into equity, but some other person will come and he will value over my company and you will get a discount back. So that is called safe mode. In India, it is called convertible mode. So whenever you will read companies act in case you can do so you will have to read about that so india companies that allows to raise the money on convertible mode but the limitation is that in case you are going for a convertible mode so the amount should be at least 25 lakh rupees in case you are raising less than 25 lakh rupees you can't uh, issue convertible mode in that case you will have to go to ccd round which is called compulsory convertible debentures debentures is also in form of uh, open rate you must uh, know about it so uh, that's how this is another way where in case investor is ready to put the money in your company but you are not able to do the valuation you can ask him to transfer the money in your bank account and can utilize it okay? uh, and uh, you can that for the valuation for the data so thank you very much so i believe we have a very good discussion Uh, as we know that knowledge rests not upon truth alone, but on error also. And that is how we started our amazing discussion today. We had a discussion regarding several topics like Vision 2047, how innovation and entrepreneurship is a key strategy in growth of a country, change in structure of higher education, requirement in increase in technical education, and the state, several state start missions. And also we learned about the new startup ecosystem and its sustainability, and how we have to concentrate on value creation rather than valuation. Valuation is all about demand and supply. Also, uh, if, like, uh, if we compare the valuation model of US and India, we have to see the cost of doing is also a factor, and we, have, we should not compare it in a million dollar budget. We have to take it as a present value. There is no fixed definition of failure, and what are the problems currently market, uh, uh, like startups are facing that? Uh, finding a uh, correct market fit, having a good co-founder, not having a good co-founder, uh, not proper mentor in the startup, and unable to delegate. Also, we continued by saying that uh, we have to look at the holy trinity in the gaming business, and we have to look for opportunities there, and, and there are obviously opportunities in a disruptive business. We have to, uh, like, a founder has to have a perspective in a startup business and always has to understand monetization of this problem. Uh, we have also seen that world's biggest businesses were during recession. But these all are technical takeaways. What I really, really believe will help all of us is present here in professionally growing character is the amount of dedication, selflessness, and eagerness to learn uh, that all panelists have uh, shown here. These characteristics uh, combined with appropriate level of technical knowledge uh, will undoubtedly aid our professional and personal development. So, Knowing what you know and what you do not know is what is true knowledge. And I would like to thank our beloved panel and for raising this evening. And thank you for making this evening. Thank you for making this evening. As a token of gratitude, I request uh, Dr. J.K. Seal, sir, to present the memento from IIT Fraternity.
Thank you. 